Let's welcome our guest, the is Dr. Enang, Wisdom Enang. Of course, he is a senior energy consultant, expert, and analyst. Good morning. It's glad to have you here. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's kick off with the, the conversation for today. We're talking about something very crucial, uh, and this has to do with electoral reforms and democratic sustainability in Nigeria. So first off, in very clear terms, could you explain the concept of electoral reforms and why they are very crucial for economic, um, rather, democratic sustainability in Nigeria? All right, thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, elect stands on a number of tenets, and one of the first is equity, justice, and fairness. And you cannot have a society that is progressive if people do not feel that there is fairness in the way that the leaders emerge. And so what electoral reforms uh, tries to do is to ensure that uh, that that whole process um it's first transparent that whole process is of course uh at parity with what we, we would obtain uh within the global standards uh of course we do know that when it comes to the success of those methods that they are meant to be enabled by certain imperatives like technology however uh, sometimes we find out that that technology, uh, for example, in the, the beavers for the upload, uh, is not working in some certain areas, which, of course, gives the room for improvement. But the entire idea behind the electoral reforms is to ensure that um, there is that progressive step to uh, taking towards enhancing the transparency, equity, uh, the, and the fairness of our democracy. All right, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to ask you now, in your own view, on your own perspective, how effective have these reforms been in improving the credibility, emphasis on the credibility of Nigeria's electoral process? Right, thank you very much. You see, um, the reform is just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the implementation of the reform. And the implementation of the reform takes into cognizance uh, solving all the gray areas that are crisscrossing the reforms. I'm going to give you context. Mm. When you implement the reform, how well do you implement it? For example, uh, the uh, electoral laws talked about the upload of data for transparent purposes. And then you have the implementation that is done. That's fine, where we have uh, you know, enough uh, significant uh, internet. How do we handle the situation where there's no internet? Some of those are not spelled out in the reform. Uh, some of those are now left to INEC to decide how they're going to handle it. And remember, I INEC is typically the star witness, so whatever works for them is typically accepted by the court. Now, let's now go to the court. Um, we've had situations where the elections are won on the field, uh, in one, in technically, but they are uh, overturned in court. And then the question you're asking me is, uh, how does that impact the overall uh, democracy that we do run? Uh, and, and the truth is this. There is no way you can certainly say that you have been able to create the electoral reform you need just by the legislation itself. If the legal aspects are going to undermine the integrity of the legislation. That is the first and primary thing that we need to understand. The other thing that we need to understand is when we're implementing, especially with the gray areas, what is the sincerity of purpose of the implementation? Because, again, as I said, even the most well-crafted legislation would have to depend so much on how it is implemented. So, uh, just to answer more directly your question, uh, how has that uh, made things differently? Well, we have improved to a degree, but there's still a lot of areas. Areas of implementation, areas of interpretation when it gets to the law. Those are areas that are still undermining the reforms that, that we have had. But uh, just to say, 
we have had very significant reforms. And I'll give you uh, some examples. Uh, before now, it was obtainable to take your uh, ballot papers and then go and vote, uh, you know, do multiple thumb printing in the House and vote. And that, that could be explained with the number of actual votes that used to happen before. Uh, you could see a very huge number of vote people where they were double voting, I mean triple voting by one individual of multiple votes. Uh, however, now you see there's an effort uh, towards ensuring there's one vote per person uh, that is being uploaded for the most part. And then, of course, uh, the idea of uh, over voting is being checked. Uh, but again, what is the interpretation, especially in the gray areas? So there is a lot of improvement. In fact, right now, the number of votes that are determining the winners of the elections have slashed by almost about 60%. Before now, you would see people win by, I mean, say, maybe 60 million votes. Just look at the presidential elections. Uh, look at the numbers that people won before the current reforms and the numbers of voters, sorry, before the current reforms and the number of voters after the reform. Right. Now we're beginning to go number of people that partake in those elections. Okay. So one of the major challenges we have um, is um, voter suppression, voter apathy, electoral violence, malpractice, and what have you. I'll, I'll, just as we're preparing for an election in Edo State on Saturday, um, how can this challenge of uh, voter suppression and political interference be addressed um, in future elections as we gear up for Saturday and subsequent ones? Okay, thank you very much. I think um, something that you, you haven't mentioned, um, it's really, which is a big concern for me, uh, is the idea of buying votes. Uh, I think What's that's a bigger it? problem because I've, yeah. I've actually voted myself uh, uh, and in a rural area where I come from, in Akwaibom. And um, I can tell you that suppression wasn't really an issue. The reason is any form of violence would trigger the cancellation of those elections at that polling unit. And not, no party um, who is looking for an advantage will, will want to create such uh, a situation for themselves. But suppression does still happen. But I'm saying that it might not be enough to alter the outcome of the elections if, you know, if the election is to proceed anyways. So um, that's not really my worry. Uh, but it's something to watch out for and to report. And it will be cancelled accordingly. I think the biggest concern that I do have is the idea of buying votes. And that, that, that's the one that's really technical and difficult to, to counter. Because this happens under a kind of, uh, I'll say, an induced free will of the people that are participating in it. Uh, it can go on unannounced, and people would definitely uh, get away with it. Uh, but then that is where you appeal to Nigerians to say, look, uh, when, when we see things like the economic consequences of the decisions we make, and that we live with it for at least four years, uh, or even more. It, it then becomes on us as a, a people to vote with our conscience, a vote based on issue-based campaign, and not really to collect money. There's really nothing you can do. You can try, but technically that is left for the conscience of the voters to decide whether there will be participants of vote buying or not. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to also add one that you did not mention, which is voter apathy. Uh, you, if you look at the last uh, general elections also, we had a lot of, we had cases where there were voter apathy. What do you think uh, led to this cause, and how can it be uh, subdued or uh, eradicated to the barest minimum? Oh, th thanks for uh, mentioning that. I, I actually forgot that. Uh, you know, the thing is, a lot of people are driven by psychology or what they feel um, is going to be the right rationale towards voting. Hmm. And re-educating people to know that uh, voting should be contextualized within the economic blueprint of wherever you're standing for. What is the economic blueprint? What do they represent? What do they stand for? What does it mean for, uh, for the progress of the, of, the, of the state, for example, or the local government? These are all things that we need to be looking out for. I think education is very key to overcoming uh, voter apathy because um, I think ignorance is really one of the key drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, sentiment is another key driver. 
So I think people, um, and these are what NGOs and the government needs to do, and even the candidates, to sell issue-based campaigns that would then override any other sentimental basis that any voter would want to put in their, their votes for. All right. Just as we prepare to wrap up the conversation with you this morning, um, it's important to touch about uh, touch on marginalized groups. Um, how can Nigeria's electoral system be more inclusive, especially for marginalized groups, um, women, the youth, the old? You know, how can we have a process where we it's all inclusive? Right. I, 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 thank you very much. I'm going to break that down so that you know we can just uh, it's it's the flesh a little bit uh, uh, you know deeper. Um, when you talk about marginalized groups, there are different ways people get marginalized. Even starting from the the, the hassle of collecting your voters' card. I've known people that said, "Well, look, I can't be bothered. If this is the stress I have to go through to collect my voters' card." I wouldn't be bothered. Those are really people that are dis, uh, disadvantaged based on the, the just the stress it takes. So we need to improve that stress. When we then get into the, the even the um, uh, collection of voters' card, uh, there's a huge struggle. Even when it is ready, you have to go and then sort it out. You spend hours. That should be solved. Uh, you, you should be able to get a text, uh, come to your location, and then everything is being computerized. Of course, it's lined up properly. And then they just set your name. They know where to go, the catalog number to go and pull out your card for you. That should be made very easy. Uh, they should increase the number of hours where, you know, these cards shouldn't just be close to elections. People, there should be enrollments and collection even during normal times. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is when you get to the vote, the voting booths itself, I have seen situations where uh, people want to come out and vote. They come out, the voting hasn't started, there's some one delay or the other, and they just feel they can't come here and waste all their time. They stroll back home. Uh, and, uh, and I know how long I had to wait uh, to oversee the process and, of course, to vote. And a lot of people, by the time we started voting, about 55% had already gone home. And, and, and so you had a lot of people register. By the time we came to voting, when the voting actually started, a lot of people had gone home. And I just think we can do it a lot better. Like even in the U.S., you could email your ballot boxes. I mean, I'm not saying we should get there if we haven't improved our security architecture, uh, internet architecture. But those are things we can do. All what we need to do to create a more inclusive environment for people is to reduce the stress involved in participating in voting. And that way people will feel more encouraged make it more transparent and people will feel more encouraged and make sure that people's votes count because you can exclude people, especially the elite class, if they find out that at the end of the day you still wriggle your way and put false numbers there mm -hmm. and the votes don't count. So that's, those are some of the ways we can you know, encourage people to come out and participate. Thank you so much, Wisdom Enang, for joining us and for sharing your thoughts with us on the conversation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Do enjoy your morning. And you too.